Welcome to MEM 07032, Use Workshop Machines for Basic Operations. This lecture is a supplement to your student workbook and other resources made available to you. Make sure you download the student learning manual as this will help you complete the online quiz and will help you complete the practical assessment. In this unit, we'll be learning about basic machine tools like lathes, mills, drills, horizontal and vertical borers, their capabilities and uses. Student resources. Good, reliable desktop publishing software is vital for engineering tradespersons. If you don't have a license for Microsoft Office, uh, LibreOffice is a good free alternative and it operates on all major operating systems like Linux, Windows and Macintosh. If you're new to CAD or don't have a CAD program, the Libra people make LibraCAD. It's a good, all-purpose, easy to use 2D CAD package. LibraCAD has an AutoCAD-like interface and all of the skills and knowledge that you acquire and use on LibraCAD can be transferred to other packages. If you have a Google account, you have access to Google Docs and about 15 gigabytes of cloud storage. Don't forget to check PMoodle regularly for the latest updates and resources and the latest information on your current unit and course. The Moodle app is available for all major mobile devices like tablets and phones. Just a reminder that all the documents that are referenced on PConnect are also mirrored on PMoodle. So if you don't have access to PConnect or having trouble with PConnect, uh, you can download all relevant documents from PMoodle. All the adapters, hoses, and components referenced in these tutorials are referenced from the Pertech catalog. Keep in mind you have access to these online from pertech.com.au. The recommended textbook for this unit is the Fitting and Machining Trades textbook. Turning, milling, drilling, and many other machining operations are covered quite comprehensively in the textbook. The fitting and machining textbook can be purchased from Hare and Forbes. Go to their website, www.machineryhouse.com.au for details. This month's featured YouTube channel is Cutting Edge Engineering Australia. They cover a lot of the machining operations that we're discussing in this unit quite comprehensively and some good technical tips to be gained. Pause the video now to record the YouTube web address. The web address is also available from resources on PMoodle. Here's an example of a nice cylinder reconditioning job. Pause the video now to record the YouTube channel address. Mistakes when machining or using machines can be deadly and costly. More than ever, we need to work smart. Think, plan, do, review. Before we begin, a little bit of history. One of the first machine tools to be built was for creating screws. Henry Morsley developed the first industrial practical screw cutting lathe in 1800. This is the great grandfather of the modern day lathe.
or the advent of the lathe or the screw cutting lathe, all fasteners, nuts, bolts, nails were all made by blacksmiths by hand. That would have been a bit of a problem if you'd lost a screw or a bolt or needed a new one. During the time of the Industrial Revolution, standardization, machine tools became more prevalent. This was the era of steam. Electric motors were still in experimental stage. Diesel motors hadn't been invented yet. So these machine tools were powered by one big steam engine. We had long shafts running through the factories and big flat belts connected to machines to supply rotational power. Apart from how, for example, laves are powered, they haven't really changed that much. In 1888, Nikola Tesla invented the first practical induction motor. This one operated with a two-phase alternating current. Tesla went on to work with Westinghouse, or George Westinghouse of the famous uh, Westinghouse company, to continue development of the AC induction motor. The invention of the AC induction motor heralded a new era in standalone machine tools. Power sources could now be customized to suit the specific machine tools. As we can see from these two pictures, the general configuration of a lathe hasn't really changed that much in a hundred years. Machine tool types. For convenience, we're going to divide the machine tools into two categories. Machines that rotate or move the raw material. Lathes, of course, vertical borers and planers are some examples. And the other group are the machines that rotate or move the tools. For example, mills, horizontal borers, drills, saws, and shapers, to name a few. Part one. Machines that rotate or move the material. We will firstly be looking at Laves. This is an ancient tool. It can be traced back for thousands of years. One of the most important machine tools is the grandfather of them all, the lathe. It was the first machine tool that led to the invention of many other machine tools. Most lathes contain the same features. It's important to remember that on a lathe, there are two methods of feeding the carriage. The lead screw, this is for screw cutting, and the feed rod, this is for general turning. Keep in mind that sometimes they can be both incorporated into one threaded rod with a key slot going through the center. The type of lathe that you're going to use or purchase are usually determined by the distance between centers, the swing, or basically how big the diameter of the part that you can put in a lathe. Is it a pulley gear or variable speed electronic drive, metric or inch or both sometimes? And what's the power source, single phase or three phase? The center lathe, or sometimes referred to as an engine lathe, are usually used for one-off jobs and maintenance applications. During the Industrial Revolution, Automation was still not a common manufacturing method, so machine tools were modified to make them suitable for production work. 
the turret or capstan lathe is an example where a standard lathe was accessorized with turrets and multiple slides to facilitate production or mass production. The turret or capstan lathe could be referred to as a semi-automatic, manually operated machine tool. The idea of making a machine tool semi-automatic for production runs was used on all types of machine tools, not just turret lathes or not just lathes. Here we can see a capstan lathe. The difference between a capstan lathe and a turret lathe is on a turret lathe, the whole carriage moves where the turret's mounted. On a capstan lathe, only the top slide moves. Here we can see the operator moving the handle back and forward on the carriage, which indexes the turret, which introduces a different tool to the workpiece. As we can see also towards the spindle, that we have tools approaching from both sides of the spindle. Someone should remind the operator that you need safety glasses when using machine tools. Here we can see typical nomenclature for turret lathe parts. Towards the end of the 19th century, automatic machines started to become a lot more prevalent in mass production type situations. These machines were still commonly powered by a flat belt driven by a big steam engine from a drive shaft. It's the same operating principle as a turret or capstan lathe, but completely automated, usually fitted with a bar feeder to feed the long lengths of bar from the rear of the machine. Automatic lathes are specified once again, distance between centers, swing, spindle bore size, pull a gear or variable speed drive, metric or inch, type of power available, tool turret capacity. These can be cam, barrel or pegboard operated, single or multi-spindle. They are still used today for mass production of components like screws, fittings and so forth. The camshaft is visible in this example. Camshaft rotates, moving the slides, opening the collet, feeding the material. Another type of lathe is the CNC lathe, computer numerical control. Once again, these are selected by distance between centers, swing, spindle bore, feed and speed range, power, tool turret capacity, number of spindles and turrets, live tooling. Some of the lathes can actually do milling operations and the software features that come with the control. Apart from the way that the machine's controlled and programmed, it varies very little from the original lathe concept. CNC lathes can be used for one-off jobs, mass production jobs, used in manufacturing cells. In this example, a robot feeds the raw material to the lathe. In the last 10 years, we've seen a phenomena of having hybrid machines where they're both a lathe and a mill. Lathes have many capabilities, outside turning, facing, grooving, boring, and don't forget about the traditional machining functions like drilling and reaming and tapping. 
knurling and form tooling is another type of operation commonly performed on all types of lathes. As already previously discussed, manual lathes usually have two drive shafts for the carriage. In this example, for screw cutting, we have a lead screw, which after engaging a half nut on the carriage, creates a synchronous relationship with the chuck, therefore giving us uh, millimeters per rev, giving us pitches of threads. Change gears can be used to convert laves from metric to inch and some more expensive laves. This can be done through a gearbox with levers. Threads can also be created without the assistance of a lead screw. Here we have a die head for creating an external thread. The die head's mounted in the tailstock and we have a tapping holder placed in the tailstock for creating an internal thread. Another common function performed on the lathe is taper turning. The short tapers, the compound or sometimes referred to as the top slide can be used. This top slide is basically offset at the desired angle and then the little handle behind the top slide introduces the tool into the material. For longer type tapers, taper turning attachments can be fitted to the back of the carriage. Simply set the angle and engage the carriage feed to cut the taper. Another common method of creating long tapers on a lathe is between centres and offsetting the tailstock. We will be looking in detail to screw cutting and taper turning in a future unit. Work holding on the lathe. We can hold things between centres. This is useful for long work pieces or for taper turning. We have the common three jaw self-centering chuck. Keep in mind, we can get six jaw self-centering chucks and two jaw self-centering chucks. There is the four jaw independent chuck. Each one of the jaws moves independently. We can hold square, non-symmetrical items, castings. For accurate and production work, we have collets and collet chucks. These are basically sleeves that are size to size with the material. Face plates enable us to bolt or clamp work pieces to the spindle. Here we have some work holding examples. First one is a face plate. Second one is a four jaw independent, in this case holding a square piece of metal and on the right hand side is a self-centering three jaw chuck. Holding work pieces between centers is a very common practice used on center labes. It can be used for long work pieces, taper turning and sometimes components can be mounted on mandrels which are then held between center. Long work pieces can also be held on a lathe with moving and stationary steadies. And for very long shafts, in conjunction between holding a component between centers. Long work pieces are supported in the tailstock using live and dead centers or centers that revolve. In the case of a dead center, it doesn't revolve. And we can have tailstock chucks that revolve. Tools can be mounted in the tailstock as well uh, with the use of a collar chuck or a drill chuck or a taper shank tool that slips into the Morse taper in the tailstock sleeve. Here we can see the various tools that can be held in the Morse taper in the tailstock. We've got drills, reamers and specialized drills, collar chucks, and various Morse taper adapters to move up and down different Morse taper sizes. Cutting tools for lathes.
high speed steel is a common cutting tool alloy used on lathes. Cutting tools can be purchased pre ground or as blanks for manual grinding. If you are manually grinding the tools, you need to take note of the clearance angles because each particular material has a different requirement for cutting tool angles. Not all high speed steel grades are the same. Some grades are tougher, some grades are harder. Use the appropriate data sheet from the supplier or reference the machinery's handbook for the correct high speed steel grade for your application. Another type of cutting tools used on a lathe are carbide tip tools. Carbide tip tools are manufactured via the process of powder metallurgy. Tungsten and carbon and other alloying materials are pressed under high pressure and temperature to form the carbide tips. These carbide tips are then brazed onto tool steel shanks. As with the high speed steel tools, the tool angles need to be ground to suit the material that is being cut. There are also different grades of carbide, grades for toughness and grades for hardness and some in between. Carbide inserts are available as indexable inserts. As the cutting edges become dull, they can be uh, indexed or turned over. And then once they're all blunt, they can be disposed of. Carbide inserts come in hundreds of different grades and configurations. They're all made to a ISO standard. So a insert from one manufacturer will fit a holder from a different manufacturer. You can see a grade selection chart here. If we look at steel, for example, uh, the smaller the number, the harder the insert. Ceramic inserts are often used for turning hard materials. Again, they are very hard, but not very tough. They're easily broken. An example of uh, using a, a ceramic insert is if I've got a push rod from a cylinder. It's been induction hardened, so before I turn the end of the cylinder down, I'll use a ceramic insert to machine away the case hardening. Then I'll change over to a carbide tip to machine the uh, end of the rod down to my desired shape and size. As well as selecting the correct grade and geometry of the turning tool, the tool needs to be set on center. A common method is to use the tail stock. Quick change tool holders with preset heights can also be used to speed up this process. On the bottom right hand corner of the screen, we can see a brazed carbide threading tool being lined up for a threading operation. Quick change tool posts and tool holders make the tool setting process very simple. Once the center height has been set and the alignment's been set, they can be locked into place. Digital readouts are a common accessory on manual machine tools. In conjunction with quick change tool holders, makes setup and machining operations very simple. Digital readouts are very reliable and flexible and contain many useful functions. Eliminates the need to look at the dials on the handles of the slides. Dial indicators are used on laves for checking runout and straightness. Dial indicators can be used for setting tapers and checking tapers. Always check for runout and alignment of tailstock before commencing any machining operations, especially those that involve turning between centers. The vertical borer is a very close relative to a lathe. It's just a lathe turned up on its end. This enables for very large diameter workpieces to be turned. Although we're not rotating the material, we're moving the material and the tool is basically positioned in one spot. This is the planer, not to be confused with the shaper. In the shaper, 
the material is stationary and the head moves back and forth. Part two. Machines that move or rotate the tool. This includes milling machine, drill press and horizontal borer. Let's look at milling machines. As with the lathe, the general configuration hasn't changed much in the last 150 years. On the left hand side of this slide, we can actually see a milling machine, a horizontal milling machine that was powered by a flat belt, which was connected to a drive shaft, which was connected to a big steam engine. Most milling machines can be identified as having three moving axes, X, Y, and Z, the Z axis being the one where the tool rotates around. The mill is a close relative to the drill, but unlike the drill, the mill can cut longitudinally and axially, actually in the X and Y direction. Let's have a look at the vertical milling machine. They can be specified by the XYZ travel, the power, the bed size, tool capacity, how big a tool can we fit in the machine, the accuracy and the speed. Here we can see a vertical milling machine performing a boring operation. Next is the horizontal milling machine. Again, specified by the XYZ travel, the power, the bed size, the tool size capacity, the arbor length, that's the shaft that's going across the bed, the accuracy and the speed. Horizontal machines can be used with a long arbor or a short arbor. The arbors are the device that holds the cutting tool in the machine. Pictured here are some milling operations used with the arbor on a horizontal milling machine. On the left hand side, we can see some machine beds being gang milled, typical production method and straddle milled. This horizontal milling operation is using an arbor. The support device on the end of the arbor is referred to as the yoke and a side and face cutter is machining a slot in that billet of steel. A universal milling machine offers the best of both worlds, where it can be either a vertical or horizontal milling machine, or a vertical horizontal milling machine, and a horizontal machine that can use an arbor and a yoke for doing straddle and gang milling operations. Another common type of milling machine is the computer controlled machine or CNC machine. There are a number of different milling cutter profiles available for milling machines. And once again, they're available in high speed steel or in carbide or indexable carbide formats. The feed direction in relation to the cutter rotation is a factor that needs to be considered when milling. Conventional milling is a lot better suited for older machines and for less rigid machines. The disadvantages are it's less accurate and it's poorer surface finish. Ply milling is a better option for more rigid machines as it's accurate and produces a better surface finish. The disadvantages of climb milling is it does require a more rigid machine, more horsepower. Again, it's not suitable for older, less rigid machines. A lot of smaller milling machines are fitted with a Morse taper spindle, very similar to the one in the tailstock of the lathe. This is usually for the lighter machines. Another very common tool holding 
device. It's the R8 system. Is it available in collar chucks? Collar chucks or arbors with drill chucks? Or most taper sleeves fitted inside them? The most common are the International 30, 40 and 50 arbors. These are available once again as shell end mill holders, collar chucks, Morse taper sleeve holders. The milling machine, work holding. We have the workhorse of the milling machine is the milling machine vice. These vices are available purely mechanical or hydromechanical with some hydraulic assist built into the moving jaw. As with the bench vice, care should be taken that the workpiece can be damaged from the hardened jaws of the vice. Use vice guards or jaw protectors when using machining vices. Another work holding workhorse of the milling machine is the clamp kit. Other common work holding devices on the milling machine are dividing heads used for uh, drilling PCDs, cutting gears, we've got rotary tables, three, four jaw chucks, we can even fit a lathe face plate on a milling bed if we have to, angle plates. Let's look at drilling machines. The most common of these is the column drill, the pedestal drill and the radial drill. Most industrial drills are fitted with a Morse taper in their main spindle. Tools can be shared with the lathe and with the mill if they have a Morse taper. As with milling and turning tools, drilling tools are also available in high speed steel treated high-speed steel, carbide tip, throwaway tip. Other tools used on drilling machines are trepanning tools for cutting large holes, large diameter holes. We've got the regular hole saws. And let's not forget our reversing tapping heads for creating internal threads. Any of the work holding devices used on a milling machine can be used on a drilling machine. Drill vices are a very common accessory on drilling machines. In the video, we can see that the drill is being fed into the material using an automatic feed. A horizontal boring machine looks very similar to a milling machine, but it's able to do very large diameter and very deep or long boring operations. Most horizontal boring machines come fitted with a face plate to clamp the boring tool onto, and they also come fitted with a international taper for holding milling covers. So you're able to do milling operations as well as boring operations on most horizontal boring machines. Here we have an example of a portable horizontal borer, or a line borer, commonly used by hydraulic engineers or technicians to recondition bearing housings. Although with the shaper, we're not rotating the tool, we're moving the tool and the material stationary. Here's an example of a shaper creating a internal keyway. Part three. Feeds and speeds. The terminology can sometimes be confusing, so let's clear everything up first before we look at any formulas. In this example, RPM is the speed in which a tool or the material rotates. So it's revolutions per minute, RPM. 
the feed rate is the speed that the tool is introduced into the material. This could be longitudinally or laterally. Let's have a look at this turning operation. In this example, the RPM, the revolutions per minute, is the speed in which the material is rotating in revolutions per minute. And the feed rate is the speed in which the tool is introduced into the material. It's very important to get the optimum performance from cutting tools that the tool or the material need to be rotating at the correct speed. This speed is determined by the alloy that we're using, the cutting tool alloy that we're using to cut the material and the material that we're cutting. Cutting tool manufacturers specify this value as cutting speed. Tool manufacturers give us the cutting speed in meters per minute. So if there's rotation involved, like a milling machine or a turning machine, a lathe, we need to convert that meters per minute into revolutions per minute. We can use a formula to convert meters per minute into revolutions per minute, or we can use tables. The formula on the right hand side has been simplified, so we just add the values without any unit conversion, which makes life very easy. Try and memorize that formula. Firstly, Let's calculate the RPM by using a table. This table was taken out of your fitting and machining textbook. In this example, we're going to be drilling free cutting mild steel with a 10 millimeter high speed steel drill bit. Where the diameter and the surface speed intersect is our RPM. In our case, it's 1200 revolutions per minute. In this next example, we've switched the high speed steel drill bit to a solid carbide drill bit, and where we can see the surface speed and the tool diameter intersecting. We're at 4000 RPM now. That's nearly triple the RPM that we can use with a high speed steel drill bit. If we're spinning three times faster, we're feeding into the material and cutting material three times faster. This is why in manufacturing or mass production, carbide tools are preferred over high speed steel tools. Now let's work out the same RPM using a formula. The formula is RPM, or revolutions per minute, equals 315 times V, which is the surface speed. We'll get the surface speed from the machinery's handbook or from the tooling manufacturer, divided by D. Keep in mind there's no unit conversion, so in our case it's 315 times 35 meters per minute, which is the surface speed recommended on the tool manufacturer, and it also corresponds with a surface speed on our chart, divided by 10, which is the diameter of the tool in millimeters. So the RPM, a little bit more exact using the formula, it's 1,100 oh, 1, revolutions per minute. Now let's use the same formula to work out the RPM using a carbide drill bit. So 315 times 125 meters per minute, which is the surface speed from our chart or the tooling manufacturer, divided by 10, which is the diameter of the tool in millimeters, 3,900, pretty close. Here's an example of uh, cutting feeds and speeds for milling plain carbon and alloy steels from the machinery's handbook. We've got various 
uh, tool alloys here like high speed steel, cobalt, carbide, etc. And we can see here that the surface speed is given to us in feet per minute. Obviously, we've got to convert that to meters per minute so we can use it. So uh, 3.280 times feet equals meters. The cutting tool manufacturers or suppliers will usually supply a data sheet uh, specifying recommended feeds and speeds for their particular products. We've calculated the RPM or the revolutions per minute or how fast the material or the tool has to be rotating. Now we've got to work out how fast to feed the tool into the material while we're cutting. This is referred to as the feed rate. Let's do a milling example this time. I have a 12 millimeter end mill with six flutes and I want to cut a slot in aluminium. Let's calculate the RPM and the feed rate. So I'm going to need to work out how fast the tool's rotating and how fast I feed the tool through the material. Obviously, I'm using a milling machine that has a automatic feed on the X and the Y axis. The first thing I need to do is calculate the RPM of the end mill. So revolutions per minute equals, there's our formula again, 315 times V divided by D. RPM equals 315 times 125, which is the cutting speed from the machinery's handbook in meters per minute divided by the tool diameter, which is 12. So my RPM is, or revolutions per minute, is 3,280 revolutions per minute. So I'll set that on my machine gearbox to the closest speed possible from the speed selector chart on my milling machine. We have another simple formula, feed rate equals RPM, which we calculated with our previous formula, times N, which is the number of teeth on my cutter, times C, which is the chip per tooth value. Let's have a look at our feed rate formula. 3,280 RPM times 6, which is the number of teeth on my cutter, times 0.1, which is the chip per tooth value from the data sheet that came with the tool. And I can get this value out of the machinery's handbook. And my rule of thumb value is usually about 0.1 for these type of operations. And the answer is 1,968 millimetres per minute is the feed rate at which I would introduce my tool into the material. Obviously, with a lathe, we're rotating the material, so we apply our RPM formula to the material diameter. Usually with a lathe, Feed rate is specified in millimetres per rev. And yes, you guessed it, I can get the recommended feed rate in millimetres per rev from the machinery's handbook. Here's an example of cutting feeds and speeds for turning plain carbon steel and alloys, for an example. In this data sheet, the surface speed is given in feet per minute, so I'll have to convert that to meters per minute so I can use it in my formula. Feet per minute times 3.280 equals meters per minute. Being an imperial chart, I'm going to have to convert inches per rev to, oh, you guessed it, millimeters per rev. Part four. SAE, steel grades and heat treatment. As engineering tradespeople, we're exposed to hundreds of different grades of steel. Today we'll be having a quick look at the SAE classification for carbon steels. Because we are interested in heat treatment today, we'll be primarily looking at the carbon content of steel. The last two numbers of the SAE steel identification system specifies the carbon content. An example on the slide 10 
indicates 0.1 of a percent of carbon content in the steel. Here we can see SAE 4140. This is not a carbon steel, but an alloy steel, but the last two digits still indicate the carbon content. In this case, 40 signifies 0.4% carbon content of this alloy steel. We will be quench hardening our steel in this example. Therefore, I need a minimum of 0.3% carbon content in the steel to enable it to be quench hardened. In this case, I'll be ordering some carbon steel of SAE 1045 grade. It has a carbon content of 0.45% and thus enabling me to quench harden it. According to my heat treatment chart, my SAE 1045 carbon steel needs to be heated to 850 degrees for hardening and reheated to 350 degrees for tempering to get a result of 45 Rockwell C hardness. So if I look at this color chart here, I'll have to heat up the, the steel until it's about orange red. That'll give me around 850 degrees Celsius. And then I'll quench it in water to harden it. Then I'll reheat it until it's around bluish color and then let that cool down naturally to ambient temperature. And that will give me some tempering, which will make it tougher. Let's have a review of the heat treatment process for our SAE 1045 carbon steel. Firstly, we'll heat it to around 900 degrees and then quickly quench it in water to harden the steel. Then we'll reheat to about 300 degrees Celsius and then we'll let it cool down naturally so we can temper the steel or give it some toughness. Hardening alone will cause the steel to be too brittle. By tempering the steel, it gives it some toughness, some shock resistance. In the case of carbon steel, the tempering operation does reduce the hardness slightly. By heating up the steel, we change the grain structure. For example, if we heat the steel or medium carbon steel to 900 degrees, we've actually changed the grain structure. Now it's called austenite. By quenching it, we freeze that grain structure to what it was when we heated it to 900 degrees Celsius. Quenching creates stresses in the grain structure. These stresses cause the steel to become brittle. The tempering process reintroduces some carbon back into the grain structure, making it tougher. I suspect a bigger bucket of water might have been more useful in this situation, as it's very important to quench the steel within one second of it being introduced into the water. So the part that's being quenched should be submerged immediately and stirred.